my name is Dwayne Haggerty, and I am president and CEO of Heritage Works, and we want to welcome you to today's uh, The Gibbs Terracotta Tour. And so today we are going to take you um, on a tour of some of the history of terracotta as a building material. We'll talk about some of the context of terracotta. We'll tell you, talk to you about how it was used in building construction. Um, and then once, once we are done with that, we will um, take you on a tour of uh, Dubuque's terracotta building, showing you some of the, the details of the buildings, talking, to, talking about the history of the building. I have with me today Jason Nices, who does tours in Dubuque, and he will join us on our tour. Hi everybody, again I'm Jason Nisus and I'm the Vice Chair of the Dubuque County Historic Preservation Commission and it really is my pleasure today to use these buildings to help tell the story not only of the city of our uh, history of our city but also the technology that made it possible so thanks for joining us. Before we headed out on the tour of Dubuque's terracotta buildings we thought it would be a great idea to give a little bit of history about the use of terracotta as a building material and the historic context of the use of terracotta in the late 19th and early 20th century. Terracotta, meaning baked earth, has been used as a building material since ancient times. It was most commonly used as a roofing material in warmer climates, but it also began, began to be used as a decorative material uh, during the Greek and Roman times. Um, terracotta um, experienced a resurgence in the Renaissance most particularly with the work of Luca della Robbia, who um, utilized terracotta as a decorative material, and which could be um, used for uh, some pretty elaborate sculptures that could be incorporated into the buildings in the Renaissance times. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a, a resurgence of terracotta use as a building material for several reasons. First, uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, uh, major cities became much more dense and therefore there were major fires in cities like Chicago and other cities throughout the United States. So there was an effort to find a building material that was fireproof. Brick and stone are the classic fireproof building materials, uh, but with the increasing density of cities, it required that buildings be constructed much taller than were previously constructed. If stone or brick are used to uh, support the construction of a tall building, that would necessitate that the base of the building have walls that are several feet thick. An example of this is the Monadnock building in Chicago, which was constructed in 1891. As you can see, the base of the building has walls that are several feet thick. They flare out at the bottom and the window openings are inset uh, fairly deep so that it would be very difficult to get natural light into the building. In order to construct taller buildings that could provide more space as well as light and ventilation, architects and engineers uh, pioneered the first uh, steel frame construction buildings. Uh, these buildings were constructed with a steel skeleton and then the um, cladding could be um, a more lightweight material. So that is where terracotta came into the picture. The Reliance Building constructed in Chicago between 1891 and 1895 was a truly revol revolutionary building that incorporated a steel frame structure and terracotta cladding. The 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago also spurred the use of architectural terracotta. Uh, the preferred architectural style of the White City at the Columbian Exposition was the Beaux-Arts architectural style with elaborate classical details that could be easily reproduced in terracotta. Though the Beaux-Arts style was certainly the most popular style of the exposition, one of the most architecturally innovative buildings of the exposition was the transportation building designed by Adler and Sullivan, principally uh, Louis Sullivan architect. Um, it utilized more of an Art Nouveau um, aesthetic and the style of it became to be known as what is known as the Sullivan-esque style of architecture. In the years after the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, you began to see a lot of buildings that were constructed in both the Beaux-Arts style and the Sullivan-esque style of architecture, utilizing terracotta 
panels that could be easily molded to evoke both styles. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, cities were dirty places because of the use of coal as a heating material. So terracotta also had the benefit of being easily washable. Uh, one of the uh, catalogs at the time uh, selling terracotta described it as follows. This is an innovation. It is indestructible and it is hard and as smooth as any porcelain ware. It will be washed by every rainstorm and may, if necessary, be scrubbed like a dinner plate. With the popularity of terracotta, there were many companies that uh, sprung up uh, that manufactured terracotta, one of which was the Northwestern Terracotta Company based out of Chicago, Illinois. The manufacturing of terracotta is fairly straightforward. It starts with uh, completion of design and specifications. One thing to note about terracotta is that um, clay shrinks about 10 to 14 percent between its wet uh, state and its completely uh, fired state. So any design must take into consideration the shrinkage factor of the terracotta. Once the design of the piece is complete, a clay model of the piece is constructed and then a plaster cast is made to, uh, to create the mold for the terracotta piece. The clay model is then removed to create the negative space into which the terracotta clay will be inserted. Um, it's also important to note that the terracotta uh, clay should include some inner structure that will give the piece uh, a lot more strength and stability once it is fired. The terracotta piece is then removed from its plaster cast. Um, it is then glazed and then inserted in a kiln uh, to be fired uh, to then produce the final result. A terracotta facade consists of literally hundreds of pieces that are hung onto the building structure uh, through a series of rods and hooks and anchors that are anchored into either the steel structure or a masonry substrate. These images show cross sections of terracotta pieces and how they are attached to the building. Uh, this, this image shows actual cross sections of pieces of terracotta that are attached to the security building here in Dubuque. Once the terracotta pieces are attached to the building, there is then a mortar that is inserted in the joints between the terracotta to keep the building facade watertight. With that contextual history, we will now embark on a tour of Dubuque's terracotta buildings. We'll start with the uh, earliest uh, building with terracotta, which was the Bishop's Block, constructed in the 1880s, and then end our tour with the Telegraph Herald building that was constructed in 1929. A centerpiece of the old main historic district is the Bishop's Block. Right across the street here, this building was built in 1889 and commissioned by Bishop John Hennessy uh, with the Archdiocese of Dubuque. Now, Bishop Hennessy was an interesting figure because he also, besides building churches and schools, also participated in speculative real estate. And he commissioned uh, this large warehouse building before he had any anchor tenants. So that's kind of what we say when we mean speculative design, is they didn't have an anchor tenant. They built it knowing that they were going to have to find tenants for the space. So large, uh, open, uninterrupted types of uh, warehouse space inside with giant freight elevators. So uh, eventually the occupants of this building were mostly wholesale grocers and there were several other cold storage and dry goods storage uh, facilities right in this area of downtown, uh, the old main district here. This building is in, uh, done in the Romanesque style. So uh, lots of heavy brick. You can see the rounded arches on the first floor of the building. Uh, this would have been where freight and things were loaded into the building. And originally, there were railroad tracks that ran right behind the building itself. So uh, heavily rooted right here in this kind of warehouse industrial district. Uh, in the Romanesque style, you also have very uh, uh, elaborate brickwork often. So you can see the rounded arches above most of the windows. And at the top, you've got a wonderful corbelled brick uh, cornice at the top. Now at the parapet level, at the building's roof, you can see some decorative terracotta. Um, 
uh, elements. And originally at the corner, where you see that rounded turret, there was uh, a little cap that almost looked like a chess piece at the top. Uh, kind of maybe a play upon this idea of the bishop's block. Uh, that turret, uh, the cap on that turret fell off several years ago uh, during a storm. But uh, this is a really interesting example of the Romanesque style in Dubuque, which was very popular before the 1890s, uh, when Beaux-Arts classicism became much more popular. So we talked about terracotta as um, a, a building material, and this is one of the earlier buildings in Dubuque that has terracotta. This building used terracotta as a decorative material and a decorative accent material for the building. As you can see, this is a brick, um, the brick structure, but uh, the terracotta was utilized for things like the cornerstone. Here we have the corner, uh, the, the building was constructed in 1887, so it has this really decorative cornerstone, and it has kind of some motifs of grain and vegetation. And this building was originally designed to be a warehouse and a grocery uh, grocery store. Um, the other thing about this building too, or this terracotta is that um, kind of the aesthetics of it are clearly the, from the 1880s. You kind of have this Art Nouveau style of lettering and, and decoration. Um, the, the terracotta was also interestingly used as a water table. And um, so, you know, the, the question is, why would it have been used as a water table? It is more of a durable material, and it also could have been easily cleaned. Also, because of that aspect of it, the terracotta was used on the windowsills. We can see this on the ground level. Um, and that it was used on the window sills, but then also up on the facade of the building, you'll see at each level the uh, the terracotta was used uh, for the window sills. And again, this was a durable material, so it would have prevented like the rotting of the wooden sills. Uh, the limestone is also um, prone to to deterioration, so the the um, the terracotta would have prevented that type of deterioration in the building materials. This is also. Uh, a very um, um, interesting decorative motif, and this is more classical. And we'll see a lot of this as we go um, further up a Main Street in the buildings that are clad completely in terracotta. They have a lot of classical motifs. This is, is what's called acroteria. This is a volute, and um, so just a lot of floral and, um, and plant-like uh, decoration on the, the, these terracotta uh, blocks. And one of the historic gems of our old main district is the German bank building. Uh, no, noted by these four big classical columns right above its entrance. This building was built in 1901, designed by John Spencer and W.G. Williamson. And it uh, is, as you can see, right above the canopy at the entrance, called the German bank building. Uh, merchant and banker John Feninga uh, founded the German bank in the 1860s. But the history of banking on this site dates all the way back to the 1830s when there was a miners bank on this site. Uh, the German bank also had a branch of its bank up in the northern end of Dubuque, which was more the German part of town, but then they also had this location here. Uh, this building is noteworthy for the terracotta ornament that's done in a very neoclassical style. Um, every square inch of this building up above the entrance really is ornamented somehow in this neoclassical design. This was a very popular uh, style for banks, especially after the 1890s. It really was a symbol of stability, a connection to history, uh, and the, that these banks were going to be around for a long time. And you can see that the ornament on this building is actually uh, meant to kind of mimic stone. Uh, terracotta was an easy way to uh, mimic carved stone. So you can see that they really used it to great effect on this site. When we talked about the, the um uh, the benefit of terracotta as a building material. One of the purposes of terracotta was that it was easily cleaned. And so you can, this is a really great kind of contrast between the, uh, the brick masonry building beside it and the terracotta building. You can see that in the era when there would have been a lot of soot that um, that would have accumulated on the terracotta and the brick, but it would have been much easier to clean off the terracotta because terracotta is a, is a smooth material. Uh, the interesting uh, aspect also of this building, it being the German bank, is that you have the insignia of the, um, the, the German Empire, which is the eagle 
in the facade, the, you know, on either side of the facade. So again, this really kind of harkens back to the heritage of the, of the Dubuque area having a very, very strong German heritage that they then incorporated into the design of their buildings and the, um, you know, the, the decorative details of their buildings. So in the upper, upper main district, we have a few storefronts that also use uh, terracotta uh, as ornament, but also as a way to keep the storefronts clean. Uh, glazed terracotta in particular was used because it was thought that especially in the days when uh, all these buildings had coal-fired boilers, that there was a lot of uh, airborne pollution and the buildings became covered in dark soot. So using glazed terracotta was a way to keep the buildings clean because you could more easily wipe that glazed terracotta clean versus the more porous brick or stone. So on the building here, uh, on this side, you can see it's more of a Gothic inspired uh, design. There was a, co uh, a cornice added at some point, but originally on those, those Gothic details would have had finials that extended up beyond the top of the roof. The building uh, on this side, has white glazed terracotta that's in a more classical style with a few uh, medallions kind of right there above the entrance. Uh, this is more, this is white glazed terracotta, again with that idea of wiping it clean. Both buildings you can see too probably also originally had a prism glass in their transoms above the entrance uh, that's no longer there. But it gives you an idea of what these storefronts would have looked like along uh, the upper main district. Roshek Brothers was the premier retailer in uh, historic Dubuque. Uh, they had their origins here on Main Street. Their original uh, dry goods store was just down the street, a little bit south on Main. Uh, they built this new building in 1907 and moved from their old building into this one. Uh, it is wonderfully detailed and Italian Renaissance inspired uh, terracotta. You can see that the Roshek Brothers name remains over what would have been the main entrance of the building on Main Street, uh, right up above, also detailed in terracotta. So the Roshek brothers uh, existed in this building from 1907 until they started to build their new building, kind of an Art Deco inspired building uh, across the alley. Uh, this building was built in two parts and the south or the north half was built first. And when they built the north half, they actually connected this building with the new building with a, a bridge that went across the alley. Then when the building was completed to the south, they moved out of this building and uh, fully, occupied, fully occupied the uh, new Art Deco building up on Locust. This building is now called the uh, Nestler Center after a jeweler who was one of the anchor tenants in this building after the Roshek uh, brothers moved out. So up at the top of the building at the cornice, you can see it's got a lovely squared off cornice with some square brackets that have um, uh, terracotta details, uh, kind of a almost a, a geometric wave pattern swirling through it. You'll also see some more terracotta in those rounded arches right below the cornice at the top and a Greek key pattern in the lintel above the uh, second floor windows there. security building which is uh, diagonally across the street from me uh, was built in 1896 and commissioned by the Stamfers department store which originally was located right across Main Street in the uh, town clock building the building we now call the town clock building so this is a steel frame structure uh, covered in terracotta and even though it was commissioned by the Stamfer department store it's always been called the security building because it always had multiple tenants so there was an entrance uh, down on the street this way for uh, individual offices. There were offices on the upper floor that weren't operated by the Stamford Company. And on Main Street, there were also a few uh, storefronts that occupied the Stamford department store building at the same time. So uh, the building was built in two different phases. The first uh, phase on this corner was 1896. Uh, the architects were Fridolin here and Son and Thomas Karkeek. There was another uh, addition built to the north on this building in 1907 uh, as the building expanded to the north. So retail stores are notoriously difficult to keep in their historic uh, fabric because they're always wanting to be renovating and being modernized. So 
the original storefront to this building was long ago lost because it was a retail store and they had to keep, keep up with the times and modern trends. So to replicate the original storefront, they used historic photographs and documentation and they worked with a local fabricator, Jamar Pattern, to restore some of these iron pillars that you see right here at the base and restore some of the other architectural details. Uh, the columns at the entrance were recreated and the transom glass that you see right here above the storefronts too uh, was replicated to mimic the original that you would have seen on almost all of the buildings downtown would have had transom glass, prism glass like this. From this angle we also get a really good close-up look at some of the terracotta detailing here um, that are right, that's right out of the uh, Beaux-Arts classical uh, pattern book. Um, some dentals here right above this first floor uh, cornice some egg and dart in those arches that go around uh, the uh, second floor windows, wonderful uh, spandrel panels with lots of acanthus leaves and those sorts of things. Really just a wonderful ex example of the kinds of detail and uh, design that you could get using terracotta. One of the best restored terracotta buildings that we have in the city of Dubuque is the security building. It's currently occupied by Cottingham and Butler, which is an insurance company located here in Dubuque. And um, beginning in the early, they, they purchased it in the, in the early 90s and started restoring it. The exterior was restored in uh, 2008 to 2010. And, um, but this terracotta is, is restrained in comparison to the terracotta that we'll see on the, the Fisher building, which was constructed around the same time. Um, but the, the terracotta that you see here is in the Beaux-Arts style of architecture and with a lot of elements from classical architecture. Uh, this, uh, the, the cladding of this building is entirely in terracotta except for the storefront, uh, well, uh, storefront level. Um, and you'll see that uh, the terracotta is, um, is, is um, attached to a, a frame, steel frame building um, it's attached to the building with, uh, with steel rods. And so once it's attached to the building, then it also becomes mortared just like a brick building would be mortared. There's mortar seams throughout the building. And so then it is very important throughout the, the life of the building that that mortar uh, be maintained very well because otherwise water will infiltrate the building and then it gets into the structure of the building, rusts the steel rods, and then the terracotta starts coming apart. But some of the details of the terracotta that you see on, on this building is you'll see egg and dart detailing. Um, you'll see this, this building has some great uh, lion's head motifs on, on the, the, the facade and a lot of very kind of classical styling of a, a classical building. And again, when you look at the details on this building, it would have been very, very expensive to have a building that would be completely carved in stone with all of that detailing. So the, what, what the terracotta does is it allows you to have a very, very um, detailed design building um, that, that is low cost because the terracotta is a manufactured material. Um, the other thing about the building is, is we talked about the history of the building is that it was constructed in two halves. And with the lighting, I'm not sure if, you, if you'll notice it, but there is a slight change in color between the north half of the building and the south half of the building but it is done to the design, the original design of the building. And we know that because we were fortunate to have the original terracotta specifications from the Northwest Terracotta Company, which is based out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the Northwest Terracotta Company um, transferred all of their, um, uh, their drawings and specifications to the United States Building Arts Museum um, in Washington, DC. So we were, uh, uh, when, the, when the building was restored, the restoration architect was able to contact the um, United States Building Museum and get the, the terracotta specifications. So when, when they had pieces of terracotta that were either missing or, or destroyed, they were able to use those specifications to, to replicate the terracotta. Um, so as I said, this building has some great terracotta, some great detailing, but the next building that we talk about will be the security, the, the Fisher building, and that building is just kind of wild with terracotta. So one of the real terracotta marvels in Dubuque is the Fisher Building, uh, built in 1895, originally called the Bank and Insurance Building. There was a bank and an insurance company which were the first anchor tenants. 
uh, W.W. Boynton and W.G. Williamson were the architects working with John Spencer as the local Dubuque designer. Uh, W.W. Boynton uh, was a very well-known early uh, Chicago architect, famously designed the old water tower on North Michigan Avenue. So this is a early example of steel frame construction in Dubuque. Some people think this may have been the first uh, high-rise steel frame building in Iowa. So uh, steel frame construction clad in architectural terracotta. Originally, the main entrance to this building was over here on Main Street. You can kind of see where it says Dubuque Religious Center. There was a large terracotta arched entranceway there, and that was the main entrance to the building. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, it was originally had a large uh, light court in the middle. Most buildings built in this era, uh, your office either faced, especially for buildings that had a large footprint, your office either faced uh, the street to get fresh air and light, or it faced a large interior uh, light well to get fresh air and light. Uh, but over the years, as uh, HVAC and electricity improved, they didn't need the light court anymore, so they built floors across the light court and capped it at the top of the building. Uh, Louis Fole purchased this building in the 1950s uh, and modernized, put the modernizing elements on it, removed some of the terracotta, and put these uh, plastic uh, panels that you see at the base and at the top. It was also in this era when they removed the original cornice of the building and added another floor to the, onto the top of the building, which makes this building a very uh, complex structure, not just because they filled in the light court, but the addition of that uh, top floor makes it an interesting preservation challenge. We're going to spend a little bit more time on the history of the Fisher Building. As Jason said, it was constructed in 1895. Uh, the architects were W.W. Boyington and W.G. Williamson, and their architecture firm was in Chicago, Illinois. The Boyington firm took design inspiration from several styles of architecture that were popular in Chicago in the last decade of the 19th century. The Romanesque style of architecture was clearly a design inspiration for the bank and insurance building, principally with the large arched entrance and the arches over the windows on the upper floors. But seemingly, it appears that the bank and insurance building took design inspiration from the Chicago Stock Exchange building that was designed by the architecture firm of Adler and Sullivan in 1893. This building was demolished in the early 1970s. One of the character defining design features of the Chicago Stock Exchange was the broad arched main entryway. The salvaged terracotta remnants of the main entry arch of the Chicago Stock Exchange were reconstructed on the grounds of the Chicago Art Institute and display many of the elements of the Sullivan-esque style of architecture. The design for the main entrance to the bank and insurance building on Main Street takes clear references from the Chicago Stock Exchange building. Even the medallions that flank the arch on either side are reminiscent of the medallions that are on the arch for the Chicago Stock Exchange. The main difference between the two is that the decorative embellishments on the arch for the Bank and Insurance Building are executed in the Beaux-Arts classicism style of architecture rather than the Sullivan-esque style of decorative architecture. As Jason mentioned, the terracotta on the first floor and the mezzanine levels was removed in the post-World War II period in an effort to modernize the look of the, the building. And one might ask why the terracotta would have been removed, but um, the, the modern siding would not have been able to be installed over terracotta because the anchoring system would have shattered the terracotta pieces. In addition to the terracotta on the first floor and mezzanine levels, the terracotta balustrade was also removed from the building entirely. We are very lucky that we still have five floors of decorative terracotta in the Beaux-Arts style to marvel over. The corner terracotta displays guilloche, which is an intricate uh, interlaced pattern. There are garlands in the spandrel panels between the windows, similar to what we saw in between the windows of the security building. 
In this image, we have volutes as pilasters. We see acroteria, then we see puti, which are images of naked babies, this one holding a garland, and then next to the puti is a grotesque looking down upon the street. Every time I look at these, I see something different because there's so much variety of ornamentation on this building. Finally, in this area, we see the garland around the oculus windows, uh, the egg and dart, and the scroll work around the rectangular window. And then finally, we see the lion's head, similar to what we saw in the security building. You really have to kind of stand and look at the building uh, for a long time to really kind of get the overall effect of the, uh, the beautiful terracotta that is on the, the Fisher building. So originally built as the Union Bank and Trust Building in 1923, we're now uh, known as the Dubuque Bank and Trust Building, uh, right here at the corner of 14th and Central in downtown Dubuque. Now built as a bank building, banks again are very interested in giving off this image of strength and stability and nothing says strength and stability like stone or carved stone. But here we had a building that instead of using stone uses glazed terracotta meant to mimic stone. So they got that same image of carved stone without the cost of doing carved stone. So this building structurally has a poured in place concrete frame at the base with a uh, with a steel frame placed on top of it for the upper two floors. Uh, this building uh, has an, a beautiful banking hall inside and right above the entrance where you see those two uh, windows flanking that arch, there's a small uh, conference room right above that entrance uh, for the bank board to meet. Uh, this building has a great history as far as uh, being an anchor of banking in this location and it's a great example of how people use classical ornament on these buildings. Now being built in 1923, this was right at the end of this uh, neoclassical era. A lot of banks and other public buildings that you would see built after this time would have been done in a Art Deco style of design. But here, we really have almost a textbook example of how people use classical ornament and detail on this building. So at the very top, at the roof line, you can see those, uh, that would be, that's the classical term as a balustrade with those little uh, balusters on it. Uh, right below that you can see the cornice and those little uh, things that look like teeth are called dentals. That's why they call them dentals because they look like little teeth. Uh, right below that you have the Dubuque Bank and Trust Company that originally would have said Union Bank and, uh, the Union Bank and Trust was originally there but they replaced it when uh, it became Dubuque Bank and Trust. As we go down, you can see there are four what we uh, engaged columns or pilasters right there on the front. These are in a Corinthian order. You can see the Corinthian column right at the top of each one. There is a, a horizontal band that you can see that connects each of the four pillars that has kind of a maze-like design on it. That is called a Greek key. And then right below that Greek key, you see some very traditional uh, swags of, uh, of uh, vegetation kind of draped down beneath each one. And then as we go down to the very base of the building, there is actually polished granite at the base of this building, but up above it's all glazed terracotta. The last building that we're going to show you on our tour is the Telegraph Herald building. This building was constructed in 1929 and um, its architectural style is Art Deco. And um, it was constructed as the headquarters for the Telegraph Herald Company. And it is still the headquarters for, uh, for the Telegraph Herald to this day. And um, it, is, it has complete terracotta cladding, um, but as I mentioned, it is in the Art Deco style. And some of the elements of that Art Deco style you'll see are the banding at the top of the, of the building with some kind of floral details and a little bit of kind of some slashes or chevrons that we typically see in Art Deco styling. The other thing is the, um, the kind of the abstracted uh, fluted columns that you'll see kind of flanking the windows. Um, you also see in the terracotta has Telegraph Herald kind of emblazoned over what used to be the main entrance of the building. And then, um, and then it has medallions also towards the top of the building. There's three types of medallions that are, are the, terrac the terracotta uh, blocks. And um, the first type is, uh, portrays corn, 
which is a symbol of Iowa. Uh, the second type, we believe, is a symbol of wheat that is more of a global crop, which symbolizes the world. And then we have an eagle that's holding a laurel in its beak that would be the symbol of the United States. And um, so that kind of symbolizes the, the, the mission of the Telegraph Herald was uh, providing uh, news and information, uh, not only for locally, but um, for news from around the world. This concludes our tour of Dubuque's Terracotta Buildings. We hope that you learned a lot on this virtual tour, but there is so much more to learn by experiencing these buildings in person. So when you get a chance, please come to Dubuque and explore our great city. Thanks for participating in this uh, presentation, and we hope to see you soon in person.